My, my wife just had our, our third child. I have three kids. I have a two-year-old, a one-year-old, and now a two-week-old. So, um, yeah, life is fun. Uh, it's, it's not like I'm a parent anymore. It's, it's like we're sports teams pitted against each other. We're, yeah, it's us versus them. I have to be flexible and virtuous and patient and all those sort of good things. Uh, but what I found out is, is I, there, I juggle so many things at one time. I'll, ch- I'll handle a crisis over here. Another one crops up. All of a sudden, the kid is crawling in the fireplace. I'm like, no, stop, get out of there. And I feel like um, I feel like in kids ministry, I, I feel like that a lot. In that, it is one of the most difficult things I have ever done. So thank all of you here today who are involved in in preschool ministry, who are involved in elementary age ministry. It is truly one of the most unique ministry environments that I have been a part of. Because not only are we reaching kids, we're reaching families, and we are engaging our volunteers Mm -hmm. as well. We Like these three specific groups. And also, if you are involved in regularly teaching kids, I've spoken to teenagers, I've spoken to adults, but what I've found for me personally is that speaking to kids is one of the most difficult things I've ever done because we are trying to get across these heavy theological concepts like atonement and sanctification. And if we don't know those things inside and out, frontward and backwards, we can't break those down and teach them to kids. And so thank you for what you do. It's a difficult, it's a difficult, difficult job. But what I find myself being is pulled in a lot of different directions with books and blogs and resources. And I want to update our check-in system and I want to like redo our lighting and fix the climbing wall and do all this different stuff. And this morning, when we talk about creating an unforgettable environment, It's easy for us to get pulled a thousand different ways, but I want to remind us here to keep the main thing the main thing. And the most important thing that we can do, the one most important thing that we can communicate to them that we all agreed on, essentially on a Sunday morning, is to teach them the gospel. Is to teach them the gospel. If you're here, um, if you're like a bivocational leader, would you, where are you at this morning? I, I served... Um, is anybody like part-time, bivocational, anybody? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for, for being here. Like especially those of you who are, who are in that position, teaching the gospel and making sure that your gospel presentation is where it should be every single week, that is the most important thing that you can do. I mean, if you want to talk about an unforgettable ministry environment, try to forget when you came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Try to forget that moment. Maybe some of us have been raised in church and we can't really pinpoint the exact moment, but we have these benchmark points in our walk with Jesus where it was unforgettable. So this morning, I want us to be mindful of what we are communicating uh, to kids. And I want to go through these blanks just really, really fast so that we can have time to dialogue with each other. Um, so, So let me ask you, what is your environment? What is it communicating to kids? When they walk in in the morning, your large group leader, when they get up there, if that's you every week or if it's a a team of volunteers, what are we communicating to kids? I've talked to Sunday school teachers in different churches and I've heard them say things like, man, sometimes I feel like all I'm doing is teaching kids how to be better people, how to obey their parents, how to vote a certain way, how to, how to do their chores and fit into the system or whatever we're doing. It's easy to get sidetracked. And we have the famous phrase like heart transformation versus behavior modification. And that's a really like cliche thing to say. But I, I'd be willing to guess that so many times we gravitate toward that behavior modification because it's easier seen. It's easier to see that behavior modification. You get more kudos from parents when you key in on behavior modification, but you do more benefit for a child when you focus on heart transformation. So I want to make sure that we're all this morning teaching the gospel. It's the best thing that we can do. So moving into our blanks here, um, I want us to figure out what we're communicating to kids. And in our in our kids ministry, uh, I there's a book called there's a book called um, there's a book called uh, Gospel Center Teaching by Trevin Wax. Gospel Center Teaching by Trevin Wax. You'd be good to to write it down. Uh, I read this book. Trevin Wax is a contributing editor to the Gospel Project. It's a curriculum by Lifeway that they put out. 
And I read this book, and I've made it mandatory for everybody on my team. If they are on a microphone, if they're teaching kids uh, on a Wednesday night, they have to read this book. And this is what he has to say. He says, the Bible has one central theme, God's redemptive purpose. It has one central figure, Christ. It has one central goal, God supreme in a redeemed universe. The Old Testament sounds the messianic hope. The Gospels record Christ's incarnation. Acts relates His continuing work through the Holy Spirit. The epistles interpret His person and work. Revelation proclaims His final triumph and glory. Here, here's the good part. We never get over the Gospel. We never move beyond the Gospel. Why in the world would we even try to move beyond the beautiful truth that God loved the world by giving His Son that we could have eternal life with Him? Think of your heart, your sins, your past, and your failures. Think of your wretched state of wickedness and your rebellion against your Creator. And now, consider the magnificence of God's love in that He would willingly give His Son to redeem you and bring you into His family. What kind of love seeks out rebels and welcomes them to His table? That is the Gospel. And unless we bathe ourselves in it and fully immerse ourselves in it, it will not come out of our teaching. So the first thing is, is my teaching grounded in the gospel? Is my teaching grounded in the gospel? One of the best uh, books that I've read on kids' ministry is actually a book not on kids' ministry at all. It's a book called Creature of the Word, written by Matt Chandler. And there's a section in it about kids' ministry. And when I read uh, this section, it forever changed the way that I saw my teaching to kids. Uh, And just allow me to read one more quote really fast. It's from Matt Chandler, and he says this. He uses the example of David and Goliath in the way that we teach kids. This is what he says. If children are taught from the historical narrative of David and Goliath to be brave like David, to grab five stones to tackle the giant in their lives, they will inevitably be set up for failure. When they toss the stones, they may not land on the giant's forehead. To the contrary, some children will lose parents and siblings to tragedy. They will get cut from the baseball team despite many nights of praying. They will have their hearts broken. Whatever the giant represents in their minds will continually destroy them. Unless unless they realize the bigger story. That another king comes to destroy sin and death once and for all on their behalf. No matter what struggles come, he is with them and will be with them through all eternity. No matter what your practice is regarding children's ministry no matter what that looks like, ensure your philosophy of ministry impresses your kids with living examples of grace. We have to ground our teaching in the gospel. Second thing, can the kids clearly state the main idea? Can they clearly state the main idea from the morning? I, these are questions that I ask myself uh, every week after I teach. I, is my, was my teaching grounded in the gospel? Were the kids able to clearly state the main idea? And you guys all know about repetition, 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 but does, does your entire team that morning know of the main idea? Whether it's two people or 30 people, do they know what you're teaching kids? Do they know uh, the main thing you're trying to get across? Is it communicated in your music time? Is it communicated by your greeters when kids come in the building? Do you have it permeated throughout your gathering? Make sure your kids know the main idea. Third thing, did I tell stories? Did I tell stories? I have to make sure to ask myself, did I tell stories that morning? Because I don't know about you, but I, I get sucked into the curriculum so hard sometimes. Do you guys uh, have curriculum or do you, do you do your own thing? Who, who has curriculum? Anybody? Anybody? Most of us in here, I'm sure a few of you do, do your own stuff. Depending on what day. Depending on what day, sure, sure. Uh, so if you do use curriculum, it's really good. It's a good skeleton for your morning. But you've got to put the flesh and bones on that thing, and you have to tell stories from your own life. You've got to make it relatable and personal. Think of Pastor Al last night and the stories that he told uh, about the young boy named Eddie. I mean, we're probably not going to forget that story anytime soon, I would, I would assume. Also, uh, the fact that we're supposed to be bug lights, not bud lights. That was a point of confusion for a lot of people. Um, I hope we're not supposed to be bud lights. So, uh, anyway... Uh, this is what I asked myself. Uh, another thing is, how many kids looked away or were easily distracted? During our time together, how many kids looked away or were easily easily distracted? Another thing, did I communicate visually? Did I communicate visually? Was I using everything I could to engage their senses? Uh, finally, did I honor attention spans? Did I honor 
attention spans. And then below that, 50% of our kids' brains uh, is involved in visual processing. 70% of all their sensory receptors are in their eyes. 67% of kids are persuaded by speakers who use words and visuals versus 50% who only use words. So this is a big challenge for us in the church today is the whole issue of attention spans. I mean, we face this, I feel like no other... Yeah? What's the fifth one? The fifth one? Uh, did I communicate visually? Okay. That's the, yeah, sure, sure. I, I want to go through this fast so we can have time to, uh, to dialogue a little bit. Uh, but I, this is a, such a huge issue that we face unlike any other generation in the past because of everything competing for our kids' attention. So what do our Sunday morning gatherings look like? In our ministry context, we don't do anything for more than five minutes. We break everything up into five-minute chunks. And so one of the things that we've done is um, if you take the m- things that are seemingly mundane and just amplify them, you can make a huge difference in your kids' ministry. Like we do uh, a review every week. So we'll tell our Bible story and we'll ask about seven questions. And instead of, hey, Billy, do you know the answer to that question? Raise your hand if you do. What we've said is, um, if you know the answer, you need to get up and dance. And we play loud music in the background. And so you go from a bunch of kids looking at you drooling like they're about to turn into zombies into a room full of kids that are just absolutely going crazy. It's awesome. It's my favorite part of the morning. Another thing we've done is um, we have like silly string competitions for answers. I mean, just really try to get creative with stuff like that. What are some things that you guys have done in your kids' ministry? I'm interested to hear uh, when it comes to attention spans, how have you helped kids make it through uh, through the gathering? What's who who has something? What's something you've done to honor attention spans? Something maybe creative that other people here would benefit from? I'll have to call on somebody if nobody raises their hand. Interactive videos. What does that look like? Just whatever, just like sure. kind of engage the crowd and get rid of their energy, but have them calm down. So it's just uh, I think I know that site. Um, that's from the Seeds yeah. site, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. If you guys go to um, if you go to churchonthemove.com, they have a lot of great kids resources, curriculum, and such. And it's there's an opener video on there. We've used that too, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We also have a five minute rule. Okay. But we engage the kids as much as we much as we can. Okay. Engage them in a lesson. Engage them in of course. Worship. Engage them in prayer. Of course. Let kids praying for other kids. Yeah. So that's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I teach um, physical Bible studies, and so the kids have for attention span so they get distracted. So I, I do like a, like when I prepare for my lesson, I read it over, and I get the kids involved in. And yeah. Different characters, and that helps them too. Yeah. So having kids act out the story, something you do. Anybody else do that thing? That's that's really awesome. Really awesome. And you get two kids to be on each other's shoulders and have them be Goliath. That's it's a little dangerous, but forget about that. We're we're not preparation people anyway. We found out. So um, so. Uh, let me let me cruise through the rest of these blanks. We've got a few minutes together. I want to make sure we get this. The second thing we've, we've got to ask ourselves is, what are we communicating to parents? Is our ministry environment unforgettable to parents, too? Uh, anybody else in the room have kids? If you have kids, um, we can probably all recount experiences where we visited a church and been really uneasy dropping our kids off because it didn't look safe. It didn't look professional. They had, like... Just razor blades in the classroom. No, I don't know. I'm just kidding about that. But uh, one of the things that's really helped me uh, is a book called Be Our Guest. Uh, it's a study of uh, Disney's kind of business practices and their values. And they have something called guestology. Guestology. And one thing I figured out as a kids pastor is that kids pastors are all obsessed with Disney. It's like a thing. I don't know. Like, there's a book called a Disney Ran Your Kids Ministry and all this stuff. Anyway, if you're not following Disney, follow Disney. So, here's what guestology is. Guestology is a scientific discovery of customers' demographic characteristics, needs, wants, 
expectations and actual behavior. It forces management to systematically examine their service experience from the customer's point of view. So I want to narrow that down to, to this line right here. We're, we're looking at uh, our guest needs, wants, and expectations. So everybody that comes into our church on a Sunday is a guest. Anybody who drops their kids off in our area is a guest. And so based on uh, what Disney has done, we have come up with our own four things that we've called our guestology. Okay? Those four things, what we've done, uh, safety number one, that's the most important thing that we do. Safety is the most important thing. As a parent, if you don't feel like your child is safe, you are not going to engage in musical worship. Your mind is going to be elsewhere during the message. You, as a parent, will not engage the way that you should. So, because we want to create unforgettable environments for parents as well, we push safety as much as we can to the point where uh, I don't allow anybody to take pictures uh, of our kids on a Sunday morning. I remember my first Sunday, there was a sweet old lady that was trying to take uh, a picture. And I asked her not to. And um, that was a fun thing. Yeah. So, um, so but, but the line is, anything you do, anything related to safety that's different than what you've already done, there will be some pushback, especially if you're in a smaller ministry context. Your line is this. For the safety of our kids, we are doing this. And no one argues with that. And if they do, probably don't want them around your kids' ministry. So, number two, courtesy. Safety then courtesy. Safety, then courtesy. In that order, we will always promote safety over courtesy. It's what we do. We want people to be friendly. That's pretty obvious. The third thing is presentation. Third thing is presentation. What does our area look like? What are we communicating? And for us, we have a shared space. We meet in a gym, so we don't have what they do here like at Stone Church with our own kids ministry environment that's themed. So we have to rely heavily on friendly faces and volunteers that are going to present what our kids ministry looks like and what that ethos is. So we rely on volunteers. We want to make sure that presentation is on point. The fourth thing that we do that we focus on yeah, that's in our guestology is efficiency. Is efficiency. Uh, this past Sunday, our gathering got out about 15 minutes late. And so you guys know that parents, when that happens, they're headed for the exits. Like, you better get those kids out expediently. Lunches are happening. Football games are happening. So we want to make sure that mom and dad don't have to stand in line for 10 minutes to get their kids and then go to the nursery and stand in line for another 10 minutes to get those kids. We want to get them in and out of the building. So that is our, um, that is our guestology. So does anybody, maybe for your own ministry context... What, what's something that, that you value and that's important when it comes to parents? Just maybe two or three people really quick. When it comes to your ministry to parents on a Sunday morning, what, what was that? Your attitude. Attitude? As they drop their kids off. Sure thing. Sure thing. Yeah. That makes a big difference. That makes a big difference. Anybody else? Would you change anything about that list? Like, uh, like my, at my church, like, we give a, like, tag to have, like, a kid name on it, and, like, the parents give one to them, and they're not here to pick up so-and-so, and, -so, and yep. then, like, they can to go faster. Sure. Instead of, like, having them wait and have us call the kid from the nursery and from our Sure. Service. So electronic check-in is really helpful. Who does electronic check-in in church? Yeah. Who has planning center? Who uses planning center? A few people. Yeah, if you don't use planning center, ditch whatever else you're doing and use planning center. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you're not doing digital check-in and you're kind of thinking about doing that, Planning Center is the easiest thing that you can do. Uh, you can run it with an iPhone and a printer. So um, finally, I want to I want to do this really fast. It, it, it's almost time to go. Uh, next session start at 11:30. Okay. So uh, finally, we're communicating to our volunteers. What are we communicating to our volunteers? What do our volunteers believe about your ministry? And everybody in this building, if you've been in leadership for more than six minutes, you know about vision, mission values, we all have those things, but the reality is um, is that we have to focus on our culture. We have to focus on our culture, and language creates culture. Get some language for your kids' ministry. What are some things that people always hear you saying? Like, uh, if I came to your team, and they said, uh, Brad always says this. What does Brad always say? And they'd say, these four things. They'd say, he has a nice beard. I don't know what they'd say. Um, 
Language creates culture. And the second thing, I read a book called Cracking Your Church's Culture Code by Sam Chand. Uh, It turns out that the title of the first chapter was the best thing I read about in the book, and that is this. Culture trumps vision. Culture trumps vision. I could have put the book away and returned it. That was the best thing. Language creates culture, and culture trumps vision. So regardless of your best intentions, if you don't have, or if you're not working on a culture, it's going to trump your vision for ministry. No pun intended with the word trump. All right. So uh, here's here's four things that you can do. Here's four things that you can do to enhance your volunteer culture. Value your volunteers. Value your volunteers. One of the things that we do, I have our family life administrator get me a, a four pack of Starbucks gift cards every month. And each Sunday, when I see somebody like doing something, going above and beyond, I'll write them a thank you card with what they did specifically, and then put that gift card in there. Just really easy, simple, practical ways. Uh, number two, connect your volunteers. Connect your volunteers to kids, to other volunteers. Make sure that no one's teaching a class all by themselves with 30 kids in there. It's, I know it's probably happened to some of us. Never me, though. <laughs> Four times. Okay. Include your volunteers. Include your volunteers. Let them be a part of the decision-making process. Let's give them ownership over our ministry. And the number four, challenge your volunteers. Challenge your volunteers. That's number four. So, uh, having said all that, it is 11.26. It's almost time for us to get out of here. And the next the next one starts at 11.30. Dave? What? It starts at 11.40. We have till 11.30. It says 11.30. Oh, good. Good. They pushed the schedule, I think. I think they just pushed the, pushed the schedule. So, um, so let me ask you this morning. Let me ask you this morning. I want to hear from you. I'll go for four more minutes. Um, what are some things that you guys have done to honor volunteers? Because this is something that I've seen everybody ask about and everybody wonder about. Uh, is what are some things that you have specifically done to honor volunteers in your church? I hope that somebody has ideas. If you haven't honored volunteers... God bless you. Yes? Well, one thing I have done, and it's funny because I didn't think that it would be any big deal, but periodically, like with our uh, we do a trunk or treat, so everybody that bought a car, I wrote them a hand of the And I have so many, I have so many responses to that when I think about your family and all that really meant a lot. Yeah. So I try to do handwritten thank you notes instead of just like generalized and mm-hmm. appreciation type things. So, yeah. Handwritten notes definitely is a big one. Well, we're um, okay. 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 Yeah. Really good. Really simple. And easy. Uh, make sure you have a little bit of 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 a Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Is that like a Pinterest idea? I'm figuring out. Yeah. I'm figuring out Pinterest is a thing too. I didn't, so I've got to look on that. I've got to lay down my pride. And be a Pinterest person now, I guess. That's what I need to do. Uh, we've done um, we've done events for volunteers. We've done uh, events at a local place called Big Al's. It's um, a bowling alley. Their website's really confusing. So if you go there, it's ilovebigals.com. Um, but it sounds like ilovebigals.com. So um, <laughs> I have a poor choice for a website. So anyway, um, who else has an idea? Who else has an idea? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Anybody else? We're, we're giving other people ideas. We're talking about the idea of connecting this weekend. Um, and this is the best way we can connect and help each other in ministry is if we don't keep our ideas to ourselves. Even if you think it's not the greatest thing in the world, somebody else might benefit from it. And then 
it's, it's amazing what a little text can do. You were thinking of me? Yeah. Like it's just a little blurb. Yeah. Like all of them. Sure, sure. And those things add up to make a difference. For oh, so I just go with her. Um, so every, I check, do like a check-in about our volunteers okay. and just ask them. Um, they're serving and they're dedicating their time. So I just ask, how can I help you better what you're, what you need to do? Yeah. So, um, sometimes it's honestly cutting yarn <laughs> or right. whatever it is that they need to prepare for. So sure. Just giving that extra help. Sure. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. Anybody else? No? Let's pray together this morning, guys, as we head out to our next session. God, I'm so thankful for everybody here, uh, our preschool directors and nursery people and our kids pastors and kids volunteers and kids directors. Uh, Lord, we have, this, we have this incredibly important ministry that we are responsible for. And Lord, we ask that every single week uh, that we would communicate Your love by what You've done for us on the cross. God, the, the whole Bible points to You and what You've done for us. And God, let us communicate that with passion and with energy as we go about our weeks. And Lord, I pray for the rest of our time here at Fusion, God, uh, that we would continue to find rest, that we would continue to find connection with other kids' pastors. Refresh us as we go. In Jesus' name, Amen.